Yeah. And when they found out that 
Fighters and airplanes and bombers did okay, and battleships and merchant ships did okay, railroad cars did okay, and so on. But between 70 and 450 miles per hour, we do not know how to fly. We pay a tremendous penalty uh, for trying to fly with a heavier than air aircraft. When the same information is put into a form that we're more, more familiar with, used to seeing, uh, this is L full power L over D at gross weight versus speed in miles per hour. And here is air venture. Okay, you can wander around and you can see all those airplanes, um, and that's where we're at. But what's possible is actually not the yellow line, it's beyond the, the yellow line. The yellow line is where we can get with present day technology. This, folks, is an indictment of a century of aeronautical teaching based on a premise that's a little bit flawed, not very flawed, but it's a system unto itself. And if you take a step outside that system, you move from a closed thermodynamic perspective that uses what we call dynamic pressure, one half rho v squared, into the paradigm of open thermodynamics, taking the fact that we have an engine, we have a fuel source, let's use that to modify this problem of viscosity from the air that we fly through. So synergy is really all about, uh, it's really all about flying using uh, the principles of open thermodynamics. Uh, there's been a little bit of misunderstanding about what I mean when I talk about open thermodynamics. I'm really not talking about uh, heat, cooling, drag, anything like that. I'm partially talking about using engine power to control the boundary layer, but there's a little bit more detail about that we'll talk about later. So up until now, when we try to approach the Gabriel von Harman limit, we wind up with special purpose aircraft. Uh, as most of you know, I'm entered in the NASA Great Flight Challenge. We sure hope we can pull it off to be there uh, up to this point. If it, the fact that they hadn't wound up having to delay the contest, we would not have qualified to be in the contest at this point in time. But you wind up with special purpose airplanes like uh, like the Professor Taurus G4 and uh, Brutan's products that we showed there on the earlier screen. The reason is, is that normally in order to get uh, low induced drag and manage the stops, you would wind up with long wingspans. And so this is where we start. When I started talking about uh, these principles on, on the beyond streamlining, I imagine that most people would come up with in their mind something like our baseline aircraft. You know, it's pretty cool looking. I think people like that plane. Uh, it's a big, roomy, four or five place motor glider. But it has a lot of limitations. Very efficient, but it's not very practical. So we can't really call things like this state of the art, even though we continue to produce long wingspan, high aspect ratio, uh, relatively speed limited airplanes that are difficult to manufacture and inherently expensive. So the problem of where we are on the, on the ground here versus getting more L over D takes us backwards. If you take a, a typical general aviation airplane and you say, well, let's, let's focus on the induced drag problem, let's give a longer wingspan, we wind up slowing down in the quest for more L over D. You don't necessarily need more L over D. What we'd like to have is greater fundamental efficiency. So as we go faster, uh, we get a lot less need for uh, L over D. I think that's the point we talked about earlier there. This is a significant statement. Uh, a lot of our wings are very narrow core, very short core number, and that means that they're flying slow as respects the air itself. If you increase wing area, if you increase core, you can hit a sweet spot in the Reynolds number uh, versus drag equation. So you wind up uh, having a little bit more opportunity. And that's illustrated in this graph. As we go faster with a typical general aviation airplane, we lose our elevator. So why are we doing this? Why are we going for more L over D or more speed instead of going directly at the problem? You have to take uh, aim at both things at the same time. Less induced drag is critically important. But so is managing small scale viscosity, the boundary layer 
turbulence that sucks your airplane and sticks you in place. Uh, I'm going to plant this thought in your mind just briefly because we'll get to a, a, a neat illustration of it here shortly. You can't see the air, so you don't really realize just how sticky it is. It's sticking to your plane. You're dragging it along. If you flew through a cube that was colored, a particular color, and you could see that air, you would just be dragging it along the sky. You'd just be painting a big old stripe across the sky. And of course, we do see this from time to time in our wake vortices. You know, the wake vortices get dragged on for miles and miles and miles. That's what drag actually is. Fluids don't have any drag. Uh, Dillon Baer proved in 1752 that a perfect fluid has no drag whatsoever. You can fly through at any speed you want to, no drag. But if I introduce viscosity into this equation, if I make it sticky, then you have drag on the small scale, which is the drag of the skin of the airplane, and we have drag on the large scale, which is the weight vortices uh, of the airplane. So in other words, to get to, to, have to get to the Gabrielli von Karman limit, we have to go uh, intensely after weight vortices and after skin friction, both at the same time, because it's like the air is ketchup. The air is like ketchup, it sticks to everything. And you can't, you throw, throw ketchup on the table, and I take a spatula, and I try and get it off, what am I gonna do? Are you following this? Ketchup on the table, clean it up. Are you going to have anything but a mess? No, your experience tells you it is going to be a mess. That's what your experience tells you. Your experience is wrong. That's truthful about what we fly in airplanes to. Okay? The idea that we have to drag the atmosphere with us is an incorrect assumption, and we need to, uh, we need to go after changing that. So here's how we're going to do it. And I'm not saying that synergy is the only way to do this. In fact, I hope it's the first of hundreds of ways to do this. My goal is to propagate this technology and all of its ingredients into as many forms of airplanes as we possibly can, as quickly as we can. But we need to use laminar flow. Uh, we have a lot of planes that do, and they use good drag reduction, natural laminar flow. So they do that on the wings, and that's good. But most of the drag comes from the fuselage. So let's go after natural laminar flow on the fuselage. Weight immersed propulsion is a great way to do that. When I say weight immersed propulsion, I'm not meaning a pusher prop airplane. A pusher prop airplane is uh, not necessarily very efficient. We haven't delivered on the promise of having the prop in the back. And as I, I usually do at Oshkosh, I usually present on prop design get into a big long-winded spiel about this, but um, I think um, if someone would like to 